Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as I was introduced, uh, I'm Alisa Bonas. I'm a developer and a team lead at Red Hat. And uh, a major part of my career was dedicated to developing Java service side applications. And after I've done it uh, many years, I about a year and a half ago, I kind of felt this uh, need to do something different and learn something new. And along came Ruby. And I started to be involved in Ruby and Ruby on Rails related projects. And uh, I also went to be a coach in the Rails Girls Initiative. And I found Ruby a really, really fun language uh, to write uh, in. And sometimes a one line in Ruby can substitute, I don't know, 10, 15 lines of code in Java. And it's also very fun for me. One of the projects uh, that I was dealing with uh, had a, a Java code base and a Ruby code base, and they needed to play nicely together in the same playground. And this is why I was introduced to JRuby. And uh, this is why I'm here. I would like to talk about what is JRuby, uh, what it is capable of, and share my own experience and recommendations uh, when working with that. Before I start, I'd like to have a uh, short survey. So if you are a Java developer, please raise your hand. Ruby or Ruby on Rails developers? Anyone heard of JRuby before this? Anyone used JRuby? Nice. OK. Good. Um, so let's kind of dive in and uh, do this uh, background on wha what is JRuby. Um, so JRuby is one of the implementations of the Ruby programming language. And this is the implementation that runs on top of the JVM. And it's also developed uh, in Java. And what is also important to know that it is a free and open source project, and I find it very, very important. And this is the website and the GitHub source repo for the project. And while this is a small detour of what is JRuby as JRuby, I do think it's important to talk about the open source uh, as a concept. And uh, I think when we are about to use open source projects, there are several things we need to check before we dive into that as users as, and contributors. Um, one thing I think worth checking is, is this project currently active? Is it alive? Uh, another thing is, how responsive are the people in the project? And third thing, which is also very important, is it welcoming newcomers? And I think, from my experience, that JRuby scores very, very high in all of those criteria, and it is a very good sign of a healthy open source project. And I, uh, I had a very good experience uh, communicating within that project. A little bit of you know Wikipedia material or history lesson. So JRuby exists for quite a while, as you can see. It, it's here since 2001. It's also capable of running Ruby on Rails apps since 2006, and it is very very tightly integrated with Java. And I will demonstrate this later on. Versions-wise, uh, JRuby has two uh, major branches. Uh, the stable one right now is the 1.7. Uh, the last release was 1.7.20. It was just a couple of weeks ago. It does support uh, the Ruby of 1.9. It has an experimental uh, hidden support for 2.0, and I will show you how to switch that on if you wish. And uh, Ruby, JRuby 9000 is with support for 2.2. Uh, it's very fresh. It's in the works. And uh, there is currently the re uh, release candidate out there for this. A fair question would be uh, to ask why. Why should I use JRuby? And um, I think it's it's a very fair question to ask since there is a um, you know a Ruby implementation, the MRI Ruby, the C-based Ruby that's out there. It's very popular. Uh, so why why would I use JRuby? And I listed here a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one was my main motivation to use uh, JRuby, and because it allowed me to take Java and Ruby and integrate them together. Uh, because I had uh, two existing code bases. But what if you don't have those two existing code base? I still think there's very good reason to use that. Because if you write in Java, uh, and there is some very cool library written in Ruby, I don't know, for PDF generation, let's say, you can call that from Java, and you don't have to rewrite that logic all over again. And same goes uh, vice versa. Uh, calling uh, Java from Ruby, if you have some existing libraries that you know that you're, they're good and stable. Uh, there are also some multi-threading aspects and packaging aspects, and I will uh, briefly talk about them as well. So for packaging, if you are a Ruby on Rails shop, this might be a little bit less relevant for you. But if your company is highly focused on Java, you probably already have this process of build and CI and deploy. And it's working with standard WAR files and JAR files. 
So if you can get your Ruby to the same point of being a war or a jar, it's much easier for you to convince and to bring this into your company because the rest of the process already exists there. And uh, it will allow you to bring your Ruby code easier to your uh, Java-based production. As for multi-threading, uh, so in the C-based uh, Ruby, and actually in Python as well, there is such thing that's called GIL. Uh, it's a global interpreter lock. And basically, uh, what that thing does is that it allows you to execute only one thread of Ruby at any uh, specific amount of time, which means that if you are on a multi-core machine, you, you can't really enjoy that fact. And people are solving that by dividing their Ruby code and their deployment into multiple processes. So if you have some uh, background stuff you need to run in parallel, I've seen deployments where you take one Ruby code and you spawn several of those so you can enjoy the multi-core concept. But since JRuby runs on the JVM, uh, on every thread you're going to get, and native thread uh, in the system, and you can run it all within one process and enjoy the multi thread concept of Java. There are some things you need to be aware of if you're considering to use JRuby. So if your code is using uh, native C extensions, that's not going to work. You will have to find alternatives. And the good news is there are a lot of alternatives, especially for the popular libraries, uh, that you can substitute. And there is uh, some sort of a price we need to pay with a slower startup. But in production, that's probably not going to matter because if your application starts and stops a lot, JRuby probably is not your biggest problem at the moment, right? So um, in development, though, it, it can be kind of annoying. Uh, so for that, I can recommend to work uh, with uh, C, with a MRI Ruby in development, and then to switch with JRuby to production. And that's going to close this gap for you. Uh, so this is my little helper. And any typo or bug you can see here, let's blame him, OK? Because <laughs> he's sitting on the keyboard, right? That's the best spell, spell checker I've ever had. Um, now let's, let's find out how we can uh, bring JRuby to us. Uh, obviously, we need to install it first. And uh, there are multiple ways to install that. My favorite one would be uh, with uh, RVM, the Ruby version manager. Has anyone used that before? Cool. Uh, there are other options as well, RBNs. Uh, just download it from the website, and there are multiple packages from different operating systems, uh, RPM for Linux, and so on. So with uh, RVM, the Ruby version manager, whoever is not familiar with, I'll just say it's uh, this little tool uh, that allows me to quickly install, but also switch uh, between different Ruby versions. And I find it very important in my case because I'm working with multiple different projects. And in some projects, I work with MRI Ruby 2.0. And in other projects, I work with JRuby. And the fact that I can do like in a second to switch between them uh, is very, very convenient for me. And that's just an example of how RVM looks on my system. So um, we can see here that uh, the star is next to the uh, uh, MRI based Ruby version 2.0 because this is the majority of my work today is. And for the purpose of the JRuby presentation, the POC, I'm, uh, I've used the JRuby. And uh, this is the currently enabled version. And if we look here closely at the output of the version details for JRuby, we can see that this is the branch that's the, the 1.7 branch. Uh, it's compatible with this MRI uh, Ruby uh, version and patch. And we can also can see that it runs on OpenJDK uh, of uh, Java 7. And these are uh, the Ruby version flavors. I mentioned uh, previously that uh, the 1.7 JRuby is capable of doing both uh, 1.9 Ruby and also an experimental support for 2.0. So if you're feeling like you're up for an adventure and you want to explore that 2.0, what you need to do is um, export uh, this variable. And then if you can see, this is exactly the same uh, setup, exactly the same JRuby version. But the only thing that changed is uh, which MRI Ruby version um, that's going to support for us. Now that we've seen how we can get it and why we should use it, uh, let's a little bit you know, check how does it work. And I'm going to go through uh, three different use cases. The first one would be Java calling Ruby code. The second would be Ruby calling Java code. And the third one, I'm going to address uh, specifics of Ruby on Rails. And that's where I'm also going to discuss a little bit the POC that I did and my recommendations while working with that. So Java calling Ruby, what can we do there? Um, Java calling Ruby allows us to call uh, either inline or from a file for uh, Ruby code. 
we can share variables or send parameters to RubyScript from Java, and we can get the response and process it, parse it, print it, whatever. There are different methods and techniques to work with it. I'm going to mention those three. Uh, it's called JRuby Embed. It previously was called uh, RedBridge. The first one would be Embed Core. Uh, Embed Core comes bundled with JRuby by default. The second one is uh, the implementation of JRuby for JSR223, uh, which, if you're not familiar with, is the uh, JavaScripting engine. So, for instance, the JDK itself comes bundled with an implementation for, for JSR223 for the JavaScript uh, engine, and it's called the Rhino. And JRuby adds yet another engine for that, and other languages implement it too. So consider the possibilities that you have here if you do a rules framework in Java, and then you can plug in all those scripting engines, and other people can write rules in Ruby or in other languages, and your Java code just can call them and you know, work with them. The third one is also quite similar to the first two. It's not as interesting. Uh, it's an implementation for the Apache BSF. And again, there are multiple languages that implement that. And what's cool about all of those methods that your Ruby code doesn't have to do anything uh, special. So you don't have to compile it or prepare it. You just give your Ruby code to JRuby and it does all the good stuff. How am I working with that? Quite simple. JRuby jar is part of the installation, of course. And if I work uh, with an IDE that's IntelliJ, I will have to add the JRuby jar to the project dependencies. If you install it with RVM, though, you also have to add an environment variable uh, that points to JRuby home. That's because if you're calling some extra libraries and gems, they need to be found. Some other setups and installations actually install something that's called JRuby complete jar that already bundles all of that. So the JRuby home might be redundant, but you will find out very easily what's, what's your case. And I would like to show some uh, real example. OK, so this is uh, my Ruby script, uh, and it does a very, very simple thing. It does a get request to this server slash API. In my case, this is a Kubernetes server. And the slash API returns a body with a JSON, uh, which uh, states what are the REST uh, API versions that this server supports. Quite simple. And that's the Ruby code. And what's uh, special about it, or you know, things to focus on, uh, they, uh, there are two parameters. Um, this is the host and the port that I'm going to inject from my Java code here. And that's the return value. That's the body that contains the JSON uh, that my Java code is going to get back from Ruby. And this is a screenshot of my IntelliJ. I omitted, of course, imports and packaging because it's really not important. And what's important here is that I um, initialize the scripting container, which is the first method of working with uh, Java and Ruby. That's the embed core. Uh, I'm giving the container those variables. And then I run uh, the script from here. There are multiple ways of giving the path type as a part of your class path or as absolute as a relative. It doesn't really matter. And I get the return uh, the response. And I print it here. And if you don't believe me, you can take it and la uh, later run it yourself. And that's the output I get. So the complete processing was done here in Ruby. And Java just printed the answer. And there are multiple ways to work with it. So you can uh, load the script as I did and uh, pass the parameters and just run it. But you can also first load the script, parse it, and then you can, for instance, run it 10 times each time with a different input. So the API is quite flexible uh, from that perspective. Now let's, uh, let's see how um, Ruby is calling Java. So it's also done uh, quite smoothly. You need to do a required Java statement. Then you do a Java import for the class you would like to use. If you would like to use multiple classes from uh, the same jar, you can do a require statement with a path to the jar. And I took here something very uh, probably known to every Java developer, the system get properties. And I do this call to get uh, the value for the JRuby home key. And then I do a puts, which is print in Ruby. And this is uh, the output of the statement. Now, what's interesting about this, or it was interesting for me, I'm going to be exploring that. If I run a dot class dot ancestors on the Java get on the system get properties, I will see the entire hierarchy of the Java classes translated to Ruby. So I can see, you know, that there is a, a map interface there, and it inherits from the Java based object. And all the hierarchy I would expect in Java 
has been reflected to, to, to the Ruby side as well. And I would like to talk about uh, this uh, POC that I have did and uh, Ruby on Rails specifics uh, when working with JRuby. So uh, the situation was that I have been asked to provide a POC for a so-called uh, one-stop shop for reports. And we needed to have reports from multiple different projects to be uh, available for users in just one place, so they will not have to log into every single project. And I started with uh, Spago BI. Anyone heard of Spago BI? So Spago BI is an open source uh, Java-based uh, BI solution, uh, which means that it's a system capable of running different types of reports, and there are multiple uh, reports engines bundled with it. It's deployed on a single Tomcat. I'm going to show an architecture slide in just a second. And uh, what I wanted to do is take a um, open source name ManagerEQ. It's a sort of a manager of managers for infra and cloud providers. And there was a report system within that system. It's Ruby on Rails based. And uh, to plug it in to work nicely with Spago. So users wanted to have reports for ManagerEQ can simply log into Spago and do it there while they're doing other reports. And so this is how I got into JRuby and uh, tried to see how I can make Ruby on Rails work nicely with Spago BI on the same JVM. And this is the architecture of the system. So most of it came with Spago. I did have to reverse engineer it a little bit because I was not familiar with Spago. But basically, this is like a single Tomcat server. We have uh, several components here. Every component is a WAR file. There's a SOAP service uh, that's uh, plugged in with a configuration database that contains different templates for the, pro uh, for the uh, reports. And uh, each report engine is capable of doing a specific type of report. And there's uh, the UI. So the flow would be something like a user would log in to the UI and either upload the template and associate it with a specific reports engine or already have a ready template that's already associated and uh, press generate report. The UI would do uh, a request uh, to the reports engine. Every reports engine is uh, associated in the system with a specific uh, relative URL because they are all WAR files in the same Tomcat. So uh, it passes parameters to the engine, such as what is the format that user requested, was it a PDF or a TXT or CSV report, along with which exact report is supposed to be generated. Uh, the engine would then uh, do a SOAP request to the SOAP service and ask for details what is the actual query that needs to be run. And uh, so we go to the database, uh, get the information, the template, and uh, throw it back here. The reports engine would generate the report, and then user would see the report in the UI. And uh, I mimicked uh, that, that flow with uh, this. As you can see, this is a Ruby on Rails uh, engine. And the entire system worked quite nicely with that. So I just mimicked the entire flow. And I took the report generation as it was, and I made it a standalone Ruby on Rails. And then I could wrap it in a WAR file and place it here. And uh, the only parts that I did had to reverse, kind of reverse engineer and add were parsing the parameters passed from the UI, because this is what I didn't have previously, as well as the SOAP part. But the rest of it was you know, an existing logic uh, from before. And um, all the other components were actually unaware that this is Ruby on Rails. Right, this is just yet another engine uh, available on that URL, and uh, that's it. So now I would like to talk a little bit about the specifics of how do you take a uh, Ruby on Rails application, and how do you add uh, add that uh, to this kind of setup, or even if you want to add it on just a standalone JVM without all that setup, it's also uh, applicable. So there are multiple steps that you need to do, but they're really, uh, you just need to be aware of them. They're not that difficult. Um, you do have to take your database drivers, and you need to um, replace them with JDBC-based uh, drivers. The good news is that there are already alternatives for them. There's the Postgres one and the MySQL one and uh, different uh, others. And you need to package your application into a WAR file. And then you, of course, need to deploy it to your uh, server that supports Java. It could be uh, Tomcat, Jetty, JBoss, uh, whatever you're using. 
So there are database drivers. Um, there are two places you need to specify them in. One is the gem file, and the other one is database uh, YAML. Uh, for those of you who are not coming from a Ruby background, but coming from Java, gem file is kind of the equivalent of POM XML. You list there all the libraries and the third parties you're using. You list there the versions. And if they're not coming from uh, the Ruby gems, which is the main repo for gems, you also list their location. Uh, database YAML contains information about your database schema, where is your database server, what are the credentials, what's the schema name, and uh, which driver do you, uh, should you use with, uh, with that uh, setup. Now, if you are uh, just using JRuby, you're going to switch uh, to those drivers of JDBC, and that's going to be fine. But what if you are using uh, MRI Ruby in development and JRuby in production? Well, that's also, uh, of course, solvable, but you need to be aware you're going to list uh, both of them. And there are different examples of how to do that. I can only say that two of my favorite are uh, you can just wrap the JRuby part in the gem file with an if JRuby uh, is defined, or you can list uh, next to each gem uh, what is the environment that you're using. Let's say it's a flag environment development, something like that. And that's going to switch it for you based on uh, the Ruby version that you, you've selected. Let's talk a little bit about packaging. He did it to himself. <laughs> um, so there is a very cool uh, Ruby tool. It's called uh, called a Warbler. Uh, it's a gem you installed in your system. And when you run it at the root of your Ruby on Rails app, it's going to create a uh, web archive for you, just same web archive you know from your uh, Java development. And it packages the entire uh, Ruby on Rails app into the web inf part of the WAR file. And while the defaults and out of the box are good, I, I do find it important to mention all the other options that you have because the tool is quite flexible. So an obvious thing to mention uh, would be that by default, this tool takes the name of your Ruby on Rails app, and this is how your uh, web archive is going to be named. Uh, but what if you already have something called reports.war, right? You can't put another one with the same name. Or what if you have some naming convention in your production? So, of course, it can be configured, but you need to be aware that that's the default out of the box. A more interesting option I would like to discuss is um, pre-compiling uh, the classes. So, by default, uh, JRuby allows that, and this is how Warbler works. You're going to package all your Ruby code in the WAR file, and it's going to be interpreted uh, in runtime, live. But uh, that kind of leaves uh, a certain amount of danger for you, because if you had an invalid Ruby code, let's say you forgot to close the method, you know, forgot to write the end keyword, you're going to end up with invalid Ruby code, and that's going to crash in production. And I don't know what about you. I hate surprises in production. They're never good. Um, so if I pre-compile uh, the classes, I'm avoiding that problem in production, and I'm getting that to that problem much earlier, right? Because uh, that compilation is going to fail. What happens at that stage is all the Ruby code is created into a dot class, right? The same way we have in Java. And that part is going to fail much earlier. Uh, that's going to save me some time later in production when my application will not start up. So even just for that, consider using that. I know some people say it might boost performance. I didn't experience that in my POC because I was just generating reports from once in a while. But that also uh, can be a valid factor that you should uh, explore. Uh, one more uh, important thing to mention is uh, the Rails production mode. Um, I assume that Ruby on Rails developers here are familiar with, with the different you know, development versus production uh, running specifics. But if you're not, I'm just going to give like a short intro to that. So Ruby on Rails allows you to run in different modes. And the key difference that is important for, for our use case here is that when you run in development mode, your code is reloaded on every request. And your code is also lazy loaded. And while that's great when you are in development mode, because you know, you're typing in and you want to see uh, y you know, your system taking effect of the changes you did on every request, because it's easier and quicker to develop. Uh, that's, of course, not uh, relevant in production because you don't want your code to be reloaded on every request. That's going to be quite slow. And you also don't need because you don't expect your code to change in production. But it does mean uh, that when your entire code is loaded on startup and production mode, your entire code should be able to load. So if you have some modules that are missing or not loading, or I've uh, experienced some circular dependencies uh, kind of issues, 
you need to solve all of that uh, regardless of JRuby and be, be, be able to run your Ruby on Rails code in production mode, uh, which is the case when you're developing something new or you're doing a POC that you know, you're going to tailoring that stuff. And uh, because Warbler, uh, the tool, specifies, you can see this is a, sn a screenshot of WebXML, and it specifies uh, that it should run in production mode. You know, and that's packaged and you don't see that. And then you drop your WAR file into the Tomcat and nothing is deployed. And you just can't really understand why. Um, so now you do understand why. And it's going to save you some time, hopefully, in the future. And um, that's it. So if you reach this point, you probably already you know, went through all this uh, process. And uh, you can just deploy to Tomcat, Jetty, JBoss, whatever, standalone with Java, without Java, um, and enjoy yourself. Uh, that's it. Uh, a small thing to mention is that the icons here are from a noun project, which is a very, very cool website. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.